Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. A blessed Thursday in Easter week to you all. We're going to have our regular Thursday afternoon catechesis on the farewell discourse in John, the second part of it. The first one having had happened on Tuesday. Let's begin with prayer. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray thee so to guide and govern us by thy Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget thee, but may remember that we are ever walking in thy sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All of our catechesis, since we started doing this a couple of weeks ago, have been rooted in our investigation of the daily office and why do we pray the daily office? How do we understand what we're doing when we pray the daily office? Not so much the mechanics of the morning prayer and evening prayer offices, but what they are theologically, what is their theological meaning? How are they rooted in the scripture? How are they tied into and how in some sense do they fashion the whole religious life? Not just the offices, but the offices as part of what is called the threefold regula, the threefold, three-dimensional, you might say, pattern of Christian life, which is the daily offices along with the mass outflowing into and inflowing into our life of personal devotion. That is to say, our life of loving Christ according to the scriptural revelation. The personal devotion really is loving Christ according to the scriptural revelation. So how does this all work? Why do we do what we do? Why these offices specifically? It seems to be the hardest of the three for people, for us to understand, and for many, if not most of us, to do morning prayer and evening prayer. It's the hardest one. Particularly, I think, when we are in the society that we're in, and I don't mean right now with this pandemic. But even prior, in fact, that what I'm talking about right now has nothing to do with the pandemic at all. But there's something about our society, the way it's structured, the way our the houses, the distance from our houses to our place of employment, all that from our church, our local parish, the daily pattern of our home lives as a result. It's all very hard. It makes for our society seems to work against, of all three of the threefold regular, works most against the daily offices. And therefore, in the church over the last several centuries, but certainly the last 100 and 150 years, there's been a great diminishment in the number of Christians who pray the daily office. And, and I mean that in the sense that it is to be prayed, that is to say every day. It's hard. I understand. There's nothing that I don't understand about it being hard, it being a challenge, it being hard to find time in our day. So how to deal with that question has been the bane of the church's, um, one of the main banes of the church's existence for, for a while, really, because daily offices are so central to our way of being Christian, which is why they're, basically in the first pages of the prayer book. So central, that means they're put up front. And yet, 
the vast majority of us Anglicans do not pray the daily offices. Sometimes it's because we don't know how, and that's a large reason why I've been doing morning prayer and evening prayer with you the last three weeks to teach how to do it. Just because particularly in the 1979 prayer book, it's not very self-evident how to do it. Um, but also I wanted to, I've been wanting to attack the question of the daily offices from a theological and scriptural perspective, which is what these catechesis have been trying to do. And the way we did so was to look first and foremost at the emergence of the daily office within the threefold pattern, the threefold regular, and that was at Pentecost. And we see it described in chapter two of Pentecost, after the coming of the Holy Ghost and, and after the people ask Peter and the other apostles, what does it all mean? Peter responds with a sermon explaining what it means, answering that question, what does it all mean? It means this Christ, whom this man, Jesus, whom you killed, God has raised up. In other words, the meaning of it all is Christ crucified and resurrected. And then they ask a second question after Peter concludes, which is, okay, well, what shall we do? What's the significance of this meaning for our life for our for our deeds peter says repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the holy spirit and that particular peter the teaching of peter is what we've been focusing on in trying to deeply reflect upon what it means to receive the gift of the holy spirit and we can immediately notice that right after Peter says we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit is when the threefold regular spontaneously emerges in the life of the church. And that's in verse 42 of the second chapter of Acts. And they continue, they, the 3,000 who were just baptized, along with the 120 who were in the upper room, and they continued in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers. And that's the threefold regular that the church, that emerged publicly, what it, almost seemed, it almost seems like it was revealed. Part of the revelation is this. The way to receive the Holy Spirit is through apostles' teaching and fellowship, that is what we call personal devotion. Loving God, loving neighbor, according to the biblical revelation. Apostles teaching and fellowship. How to love God and love neighbor according to the, according to the biblical revelation is the teaching of the apostles. And it is only experienced in fellowship, in community. Okay? There's no such thing as private Christianity. You can't be a Christian of one. You can't never go to church. You can't never receive the communion. You know, you can't ever, you can't never be with another Christian. Okay. Besides the fact that you can't do it. I mean, when we're baptized, we're made one with all of the members of Christ. So it's impossible there as well. Baptism renders individual Christianity impossible. So apostles teaching and fellowship is our life in community according to the biblical revelation, loving God and loving neighbor. It's a lot, but personal devotion can be, is almost infinitely variable according to personal temperament and, and interests and gifts and situations in life. You know, a 10 year old's depiction of personal devotion will be, probably very, very different than a 90-year-old personal devotion. Okay? A, an urban person's personal devotion will probably look different than a rural person's personal devotion. It's all personal devotion. And what we do within personal devotion is, is in some sense up to us. And it's it, by that more specifically, it's up to how the Spirit moves us. 
are we moved for in, for our personal devotion to read the Gospel of John, for example? Are we moved by our personal devotion to volunteer to help a person learn how to read? And both of those are personal devotion. It's what we're it's what we're motivated to do by God. How we feel God is calling us according to our skills and temperament and situation in life. Another form of personal devotion is, is being at home, reading the scriptures. Maybe that's all you can do because you're not able to leave your home. But that's glorifying God. Personal devotion is glorifying God in whatever way we can, according to our skills and according to our temperament, our abilities, and our situation. Reading the Bible, helping a person learn how to read, reading about the saints, just engaging in silent prayer, contemplative prayer or centering prayer, wordless prayer. So it's apostles teaching in fellowship because we always do it according to the apostolic teaching. The breaking of the bread is part of this as well, the Eucharistic life. Not breaking the bread because when the bread is broken, Christ is revealed, as he was in Luke's chapter, according to Luke in his 24th chapter. It's not just receiving the Eucharist, receiving the bread broken, but orienting our life around the Eucharist and in some sense our lives becoming Eucharistic, which means our life becoming lives that give thanks. The word Eucharist means giving thanks. So becoming Eucharistic people is part of what breaking of the bread has to do with. But it it necess it, it's it's predicated upon receiving the actual body and blood in the bread and the wine at Mass. So that's Apostles' teaching and fellowship or personal devotion, breaking of the bread, which is the Eucharistic life centered around the Mass. And then finally, the prayers are what's described in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2. It's the prayers of the body. And the prayers of the body are what we call the office, the offices. And the office is the fact that the body can pray all together at once, according to the same basic pattern, comes from the fact that Jesus only taught one particular prayer to the people, the Our Father, the Pater Noster. And it was a set prayer to be said by the people, which is why the prayer begins with the words, Our Father. We all say the Our Father. We all say the prayers together, and the way that we all say the prayers together is through morning prayer and evening prayer. It constitutes the daily prayer of the church along with the Mass, the daily liturgy. And when we say morning prayer and evening prayer, or in the case of some of us, sing or chant morning prayer and evening prayer, wherever we are when we are doing so, we are instantiating the church specifically the liturgical aspect of the church. We are the church, and we are making the church real when we say morning prayer and evening prayer. So that's, again, a, a review that sort of picks apart the three aspects of the threefold regula. But we need to step back and to understand it as all working together, the three, to, to, to do what Peter said we are to do as baptized Christians, which is to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How could Peter say that that would happen? How could he speak authoritatively about that? How is it that he knew that the threefold regular would be the way we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, if, if not because when he and the other apostles, along with Mary and the other women, the 120 that made up the body of the first church in the upper room, sent there, therefore were apostolic by Christ just before he ascended to wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit, 
the promise of the Father. Peter knew that if you engage in something like these three modes of being, the mode of breaking the bread, knowing that Christ's I amness is present, and praying through the scriptures, the offices, the liturgical prayer through the scriptures, because Christ taught them how to find him, his I amness, he taught them through the scriptures. And then their life in community, sharing, learning, being taught by, confessing, feeling forgiveness, offering forgiveness. All of those things we've talked about in some kind of incredibly inspiring and inspired stew of community life in the upper room over those nine days happened. And so I think part of the reason the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost is because each member of the upper room church, all 120 of them, with Mary as their mother, knew Christ was present and had no trouble, no res reservation, no hesitance in proclaiming that. And the, the whole church in one, with one accord, praying together, knowing of Christ's I amness, blew the door off the room because that's what happens when a group of people are in one accord, praying together. According to the threefold regular, the Holy Spirit comes. Okay. And it's a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is sent by the Father, Jesus said. And I think when what's one, that's where we spent last time looking at a bit, how the, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said in John's gospel, is sent by the Father. Now, Jesus, it seems, asks the Father to send the Holy Spirit, but the, it's the Father who sends it at the request of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. And when we think about that, the, or, the origin of the Holy Spirit being the Father, we have to see that central to the nature of the Holy Spirit is the mystery of the uncreated, unbegotten Father, who is the maker of all things visible and, and invisible, the maker of all things seen and unseen is where the Holy Spirit originates. This, this mystery that's beyond our ability to even call it a mystery, it seems. The, the Father. And so there's something of the, of the character of the Holy Spirit that is deeply imbued with mystery, and it's, a, it's the mystery of God, the mystery of God in Christ. It's the mystery of Christ on the cross, dying, resurrected. It's the mystery of God made man. It's the mystery of the word becoming flesh. It's all of it. It's the mystery of Mary's yes to God, becoming the mother of God, being the mother of the church. It's the mystery of how God operates and flows through the lives of saints and through us. It's the mystery of how at baptism we are taken up into heaven already. It, the mystery, I mean that in the most inclusive sense, that the Holy Spirit's identity is this mystery rooted in the Father and how the Father is revealed through Christ. By engaging the mystery of the faith, and really allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and open enough to engage the mystery of Christ, the mystery of God, all of it, in any of it. To move from logical thinking simply into 
openness, uncertainty, in a sense. Not uncertainty about God, but uncertainty about God's mystery, because we need to allow ourselves to be open to the mystery before the mystery is revealed as mystery. To allow ourselves to be taken up in the mystery is how we begin to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God holds out the gift of the Holy Spirit to us in baptism. He comes before us. He always acts first. He offers the gift to receive the gift, not just as something that we take and then consume and throw away. Not at all that, but rather to receive the gift of who we are and who we are to become by being remade into the image of Christ. To receive the gift, which is a lifelong journey of growing into the image and likeness of Christ by grace. To receive the gift like we receive Christ in our homes, in our hearts, not as a temporary resident, but indeed a permanent one. To receive the gift demands we open ourselves to the mystery. How do we keep the mystery, or how do we keep ourselves open to the mystery is precisely the purpose of the threefold regula. Jesus, in his farewell discourse in John's Gospel, chapter 14, says that if, we, if Jesus will abide with those who keep his word, Keeping his word is another way of saying being open to the mystery of God revealed in Christ. Keeping his word, the way we do that is by morning prayer and evening prayer without fail every day. Because by praying the offices, we literally keep the words of Christ. Because the offices are built upon scripture. That which is invariable in the offices, the prayers that never change are built on scripture. In, some, in many cases, are scripture. And then the Psalms and the lessons obviously are scripture. And by sitting with them and reading, marking, learning, and inwardly digesting them, we are keeping God's word. But we're also keeping God's word by even doing this in the first place is the point I want you to see. You know, people might say, why pray the offices? I'll just, I'll just open my Bible. It's not enough. And I, and I say that with great reverence. It's a, a, reading the Bible is, a trans, is being transported to heaven. It can be. But the way that the church receives the gift of the Holy Spirit is through the corporate prayers. And the corporate prayers are offices, morning prayer and evening prayer. That's the pattern. It's what's reliable. It's what is guaranteed to work, according to the church and the revelation. And it's how the church has received the gift of the Holy Spirit from the beginning. But what we have to do when we pray morning prayer and evening prayer is realize that we're engaging in a great mystery and we, we must allow ourselves to be open to that mystery. That doesn't mean that every prayer time we, we pray morning prayer and evening prayer, we're going to be struck by the lightning of revelation no, all of that is up to God. When he wants to teach us something, when he wants to strike us with illumination, that's his decision. 
But what I have found is the more that we make morning prayer and evening prayer in tandem, of course, with the Mass and upflowing in, into our devotional life, but the more that we make morning prayer and evening prayer our daily discipline, and it becomes the exception, not that we pray morning prayer and evening prayer, but the exception that we don't. That we put ourselves in a place where God calms our mind, calms our monkey mind, all the voices in our mind, over time, and allows us to hear the word particularly through the Psalms and engage in the drama of the Psalms. And hear God and in some sense, therefore, be led by him. It was a long review. If you have your Bible, we're going to pick it up as by way of point of departure where we left off last time, which is in verse, excuse me, in, in John's gospel, chapter 14, verse 26. So 14, 26 of John. Jesus said, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. That's an, that's an inexhaustible verse right there. Again, we have the Father sending the Holy Spirit in Christ's name. Part of why the church so often says or ends prayers with in the name, in the holy name of Jesus. Or, with, or why we hear so often that we that we worship the name because in Christ's name is the Holy Spirit and that's what Paul taught in Romans that no one can even say the name of Christ without the gift of the Holy Spirit it's, it's always the Holy Spirit who empowers us even to say the name Jesus how often do we say Jesus during morning prayer and evening prayer? Every single time we do it, it's the Holy Spirit doing it through us. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. There's no qualifications there. All things are taught by the Holy Spirit. All things about Jesus. All things about the faith. All things about who we are and who we are becoming in Christ. All things about our sin, all things are taught by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's hard to think about how we are taught all things. It's like, a, it's like a meta thing, right? But it's clearly taught by Jesus that everything we learn is by the Holy Spirit. So we need to accept that and in our understanding regard everything that we learn as coming from the Holy Spirit. And when we do so, that even that is receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, to know that all things that we learn come from the Holy Spirit. And that last part of the verse, and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. It's the Holy Spirit who brings to our remembrance all that Christ said to the apostles, said to the twelve. And I think we can expand that, said to Mary, and said to the other of the 120 of the upper room church, including saints like Mary Magdalene and Martha and Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Salome. So whenever we are remembering what the words of Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit working through us. So you see, this is all 
of the character of the Holy Spirit's mystery, identity of, of mystery, because he comes from the Father. The Holy Spirit comes from, <laughs> all of a sudden I was going to say the Holy Spirit comes from parts unknown, but that's true. You know, the, the, the introductions of a boxing match, you know, from or a, or a wrestling match, WWF or WW, whatever the letters are these days, from parts unknown, right? The Holy Spirit comes from other, capital O, because that's where the Father comes from or, or is, the great other. The Father is transcendent, so therefore the Holy Spirit is transcendent, transcends time and place, the conditions of our existence is the origin of the Holy Spirit, because the, the Holy Spirit, he, he is sent by the Father. And so keeps the characteristics of origin, origin being the transcendent other beyond time and space. And so if the Holy Spirit is bringing to remembrance the words of Jesus, that means that the words of Jesus are caught up and in some sense from the transcendent reality beyond time and space. Why Jesus' words have so much authority and have authority. In, in other words, people order their lives around the words of Jesus. Why? Because they are imbued with transcendence. We need to also know that that word remembrance doesn't just mean recalling something from our past. Because in some sense, we don't have a recollection of the past. We, Many of us, well, I'm, I'm turning 46 this summer. Wherever, whenever you were born, right? None of you were born 2,000 or so years ago. So, so first of all, we're talking about not our personal memories, but the memory of the church that we are participating in through our membership in the church, through baptism, and the liturgy, the daily offices, and the mass give us the sense of recollecting the memory of the church and we and we are caught up into the memory of the church because the church is that body that keeps the word remembers the words of christ and treasures them and so why pray the daily offices to be caught up in the memory of the church the living active memory but the living active memory of the church is Christ's I am-ness. His presence glorified and resurrected and, and here as well as in heaven. And that word remembrance ties into that because in the, in the scripture, remembrance, again, is not merely recollecting something from our past and bringing it to mind as a memory. Remembrance has to do with, well, it comes from a Greek term that anamnesis, making or being actually present again. So when Jesus says, for example, at the Last Supper, take, eat, take, drink, do this for the remembrance of me in the English translation, that would be fleshed out according to the literal Greek do this for the actually making present of me again. Or do this for the actually making present again of me. The remembrance of me. The actually making present again of me. And so when the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance all that Jesus has said to us, the Holy Spirit is doing is making Christ's I am-ness present. Making Christ's Present is what the Holy Spirit does. And in so doing, teaches us all things. It's 
still haven't gotten past verse 26. The next verse is a famous one because it's taken up into our liturgy. Peace I leave with you. This is verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. This isn't something else than what we've been talking about. Peace is another way to speak of Christ's I am-ness, is another way to speak of the Holy Spirit's activity in our lives, of leading us and teaching us all things. It's peace. Peace is also transcendent. Peace is heavenly before it's ours. Christ gives us his peace. And Easter Sunday evening when he comes to the upper room to be with those gathered there, amongst his first words are peace, resurrected, glorified Christ, first words, Peace. He brings peace from heaven, and this is the peace that we share at Mass when we exchange the peace. As I often say glibly, you know, the peace is not for saying, hey, how's your golf game? Or I love that recipe that you made. Give it to me, will you? Or, Give me the recipe. No. The exchange of peace is recognizing that we are participating in the heavenly economy of God who has given us his gift of peace so that we can recognize it in another person and thereby share it together because the exchange of the peace is Christ exchanging and being at unity with Christ. You and I at the Mass exchanging peace, we are both members of the body of Christ and therefore it's Christ being seeking and being at unity with Christ by means of Christ. By, by means of Christ, I refer to the altar, Christ on the altar. We turn to chapter 15. There's more teaching specifically about the Holy Spirit from Jesus. The end of chapter 15. This whole three, these whole three chapters are impossibly rich. Um, actually, four chapters, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Jesus is fair with this. I mean, it's just impossibly rich. It, I'm only focusing on the parts about the Holy Spirit. So verse 26. When the counselor comes... That's the Holy Spirit. One of the names of Christ has many names. The Word. Um, the Son of God. Son of Man. The Eternal Word of the Father. These are, these are titles of Christ. As I've said, although we don't often find this if you Google names of Jesus, but he himself basically also named him as I Am. From Exodus, but then also all the times Jesus in John's gospel says, I am. And then before Abraham was, I am. Right, so I think we can, it's helpful anyway for prayer to regard that perhaps Jesus' most mystical name is I am. And so his presence is I amness, you see. But the, the Holy Spirit has names too. The paraclete is one. The counselor is another. When the Holy Spirit comes, whom, whom I send to you from the Father, again, from the Father sent by Christ, even the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. The Orthodox make a lot of that phrase right there, as they should. It seems quite clear that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, according to Jesus in John. I know there's other verses that we could look at to say that, to, to see that it seems that, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
it seems though that more often than the description is that the Holy Spirit comes from the Father, sent by the Son. He will bear witness to me. And then verse 27, and you also are witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. They are witnesses because the Holy Spirit is allowing them to be witnesses because the Holy Spirit guides us into truth and bears us, bears witness of Jesus, helps us to remember his words and thereby keep his words. And therefore, because we keep his words, Jesus abides with us. And not just Jesus, but the Father also, the great transcendent other, abides with us. When we keep the words of Jesus, which we're enabled to do by the Holy Spirit. This is why we pray the offices. I, I keep coming back to this, but this is what we set off from in the first place. Why do we do the offices? To be taken up into the real Christian life. To be taken up into the redemptive stream and to participate in the redemptive stream of God. The economy of God through Christ. We need to know that the church is instantiated by people who are embracing the threefold regula. And the church is not instantiated by Christians who don't. They're still Christians. They're not receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are not receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit unless we do what Peter told us to do, which is be baptized. And the way that we are baptized is to embrace the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and the prayers as our way of life. And thereby we become more and more reformed into Jesus, he who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Moving a little bit further down into chapter 16. Verse 4. I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Jesus saying he's leaving makes them sorrowful. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. And he's, this, is, this comes dramatically uh, at what our gospel passage today when Mary Magdalene seem to reach out and touch the feet of Jesus at the empty tomb after she recognized Jesus because he said her name, whereas she had thought he was a gardener. She must have reached out, it seems, and perhaps touched his foot where she had anointed him, having also anointed him on the head. Jesus said, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. Same thing here. It is to your advantage that I go away, so don't hold on to me in the way that you know me, he was saying to Mary Magdalene. For if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. That's a big, we, we, we skip right over that part of this verse, but we who have been meditating on the role of the Holy Spirit and how the whole Christian life is receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a really big deal, you see. If Christ doesn't go away, he's saying, in effect, there will be no church. It has to go away so that there will be a church of people embracing the threefold regula as the way to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, to receive the counselor. But if I go, I will send him to you. Verse 6. And when he comes, he will convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. 
of righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no more and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. It's an elaboration on the teaching we heard before about that the Holy Spirit teaches us all things. So it teaches us about our sinful ways, teaches us about our righteousness through Christ, living the baptismal life, and teaches us of judgment. Those are all dimensions or aspects of truth, all dimensions and aspects of Jesus, who is truth. Verse 12, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. That's, that's such, a, such a verse. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Well, when will they be able to bear the truth, the th bear the things that Jesus said? I think it's when they grow more mature in their Christian life. I mean, this really is why Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. It wasn't out of their punishment. It was because of out of God's love for them, which we see because he gave them clothes. They couldn't handle the truth in their immature spiritual development. So he sent them away so that they could become more mature in their faith. Same thing here. It's like Jesus is almost expelling them from the garden. You, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. I, it's like, can you imagine? Tell us. Yes, we can. And Jesus is like, no, you can't. Believe me. You're not ready. But he goes on to say, verse 15 of chapter 16, when the spirit of truth comes, again, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. It's a very interesting phrase right there. Whatever he hears, he will speak. I haven't been quite able to piece it out yet. I'm still thinking about how what this means. It's very provocative. Whatever he hears, he will speak. Certainly whatever he hears from the Father, he will speak. But the Holy Spirit is God along with the Father and the Son. So there's this sense of, I'm, I don't exactly know how this verse works. I'm, I'm intrigued by it. Apparently I cannot yet bear the meaning of it yet. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He, this is still the Holy Spirit, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Declare the truth. Declare reality. Declare it's the beatific vision. It's the vision of God. Also why they can't bear it now. They're not ready yet to see the vision of God face to face. None of us are. We grow in our ability to do that. And that's a growth it begins in this life and continues into the next. Growing in the spirit. Growing in our humility. Growing in our ability to see. This is rich, profound stuff. But God, in his great love for us, has given us the means to participate in this growth of, the, of, the, of our spiritual lives through the receiving day by day of the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
and therefore becoming more and more like Christ, reformed into his image. God, in his great love and compassion for us, has given us the means of, of answering the question, okay, but how? Or, which is a version of, brethren, what shall we do? The second question the people asked Peter after he preached on Pentecost. Be baptized, which means that we repent, which means that we turn to God. And the way that we embrace our baptismal identity is through the life of the church, which began with Mary's yes to God at the Annunciation, which is like the one-fold regula, be it unto me according to thy word which becomes through the upper room experience, the threefold regula in Acts chapter 2, the apostles teaching fellowship, which is our personal devotion, the breaking of the bread, which is our Eucharistic life, of receiving Christ, becoming, becoming him through receiving him, and the prayers, the offices, morning prayer and evening prayer. This is the gift. This is the gift that God has given us, the means to do it all. Not that we accomplish it of ourselves, but by opening ourselves in humility to doing them. God works through us. God allows us to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as we can bear it. He never gives us meat when all we can handle is milk. The movement from milk to meat happens through our religious life of threefold regular, embracing it. This, but it's all embracing the mystery of God in us and the mystery of us, of our becoming he who is I am. And so it's the mysterious aspect of all this that is what is needed. And my fellow priests or catechists, we need to teach this mystery to our people so that they can be caught up in it and know that this isn't just about saying prayers at certain times in a mechanical fashion because the priest harangues us to do so, but rather it's participating in a mystery of who we are becoming, which, who is Christ. And that this is the way to do it. This is the narrow path. But it's a path that's available to us. And as Anglicans particularly, it's a path that we have ordered our prayer book around. This book, it's imperfect as this particular edition of it is, the 1979, it's still brilliant. Because it orders the threefold regular for us. The way that people can do it. And that's what we are doing. And so I'm going to stop here. I didn't get to the questions that were asked me. I'll get to those at our next catechesis time, which will be on Saturday at 3 p.m. But I'm going to stop here for today. And um, we will pick it up again at 5 o'clock for, for, for our evening prayer service. Finish with a prayer. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patient and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, peace.